In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the feast of the most precious blood of our Lord, a very important feast. This is what we should say to each other today. Happy feast day of our redemption. Happy feast day of our salvation, because we have been redeemed not by the blood of goats and oxen, like the sacrifices of the Old Testament, but we have been redeemed by the most precious blood of our Lord, the Immaculate and Divine Victim. This was his choice. He could have redeemed us after the Incarnation just by a wish, just by a prayer he could have redeemed us. That's what Abbot Marmion Columba Marmion says in his book Christ the Life of the Soul but he wanted to show us the gravity of sin and therefore he went all the way he injured all the sufferings sufferings in his soul by the humiliations and the contradictions and by being called a blasphemer by being called uh, unfaithful to the church of the time, to the synagogue. He endured all that and all the sufferings in his body until all was consummated. As we sung the gospel of today, there was nothing left for him to do. And he wanted to show us not only the gravity of sin, but he wanted to show us the love that he has for souls, for the salvation of souls. Each soul that he has created is dear to him. If there would have been only one sinner, he would have done the same thing to redeem that sinner, to save that soul, to enjoy the company of that soul for all eternity. And therefore, we must be grateful for our Lord, and the best way to be grateful is to show in practice how much we value our redemption and the price of our redemption. And to do that, that means we have to fight against errors that are leading the souls away from salvation from this precious blood. And this is what the Catholic Church has always done and will continue to do. This is what defines the Catholic Church. Her work for the salvation of souls, her work to dispel errors wherever we find them, Even if the church uh, is being vilified by her enemies, she continues the work. And so this is why we have to preach always with a great vigor against all that is an obstacle for the salvation of souls. And a great obstacle, as you know, because otherwise you would not be here, is the revolution that has happened in the Catholic Church. That establishment of a new church, a conciliar church. A church which is not Catholic anymore, is Catholic only by name. A church that has turned her back to 2,000 years of tradition, a church that promotes error and heresies. And if I preach about this question of an agreement with that conciliar modernist church, it's not because I like it. It's much more work for me since all those shenanigans have started. 
I can't say I have a quiet life anymore. And so once again I have to talk about some arguments that are presented to our faithful by different people. I have people here from this parish who come to me and ask me questions about what they see on the internet and nowadays everything is on the internet and I have to give them an answer but it would take me too much time to answer to each of them individually and repeat and repeat and repeat all the time so that's why I answer with groups of arguments and in public with everybody so that that way everybody will save time and uh, one of those uh, questions that have very much troubled the, the faithful these last few days uh, was the, um, an official letter from the society about the fact that we would not ordain in June the 29th, which was last Friday, that uh, His Excellency Bishop Ali will not ordain the three Dominicans subdeacons from every A who were supposed to be ordained deacons on that day and he would not either ordain the three uh, capuchins traditional capuchins deacons who were supposed to be ordained priests on that day and they give a quote from St. Timothy as a reason for that that they say that St. Timothy, uh, Saint Paul to Timothy says you should not lay your hands on a candidate if you're not sure about him. Now that is very strange because the first to lay his hands on the candidates of these two religious congregations was the Archbishop. I know because I have been a member of the Capuchins for three years and a half. And our formation was faithful to the church, faithful to tradition. And we finished our formation in Econ. For many years, our priests were trained in Econ. We received the same formation. And those are two holy orders of mendicants, friars, who live in poverty and penance, and uh, who know a lot about their theology. They don't have to do as much pastoral work and travel all the time like we do. They can study and study and study hours every day. So if now we refuse to ordain them and we know that they have not changed so somebody else has changed. Also we have learned that Father Damien Fox prior of Toronto the greatest city in Canada has preached last week against a practical agreement has made a sermon and a conference and two days later the district superior of Canada met him and ordered him to leave Toronto and to go to Quebec and to be there in a silent retreat for three weeks in practice that means he's going to be incommunicado for three weeks until the district superior comes back from Europe. Father Fox has not preached a modernist sermon. He has not preached an heretic sermon. He just preached, I know I listened to it. It's on YouTube. He just reaffirmed the doctrine of the society that we have and that we are supposed to still have. And so those things disturb the faithful and they disturb the priests. And that is why we have to answer these questions from the faithful. And so the arguments that I will answer now in favor of a practical agreement, the faithful saw them on the internet. And they ask questions about them, so I have to answer. 
The first argument that's been reported to me, and I will see five of them today, is uh, we are Romans. The Archbishop always has insisted that the members of the society should have a great attachment to Rome. We are Romans, we cannot leave this title behind us. We have to do whatever we can to remain attached to Rome, and such, therefore, is a reason for a practical agreement. So I say to that, this is true. We are Romans. We love Rome. What they said about the Archbishop is true. But not any kind of Rome. So I will, as you know, my custom is always to answer with the official documents of the society. And here, my main uh, source of answers will be taken from the 1974 Declaration of the Archbishop Lefebvre, November 21st. And some, somebody told me, oh, Father, you always quote these old documents. They are outdated. They do not apply to the present situation. Well, my answer is this. Go back to the Catechism of the Crisis in the Church and you will see what answer the Archbishop gave to that. This is actually an argument that uh, is being uh, propagated by modernists in Rome about the former magisterium of the Church. Cardinal Ratzinger told the Archbishop Lefebvre himself about the condemnation of religious liberty by Pope Pius IX in 1864. This is what he said. Well, dear Archbishop Lefebvre, those condemnations against religious liberty and those condemnations by St. Pius X against modernism, they were good in their days. They were necessary in those days. But today the situation has changed and we don't need them anymore. They have no value anymore. That's, their, that's their, why they turn their back to tradition. Because they don't believe it, they believe it doesn't apply to the circumstances of today. And this, in fact, this statement has itself been condemned. <laughs> it's crazy. So the same thing applied to that objection about the books of Archbishop Lefebvre and all that. They do apply. Rome has not changed. It, the only change that happened in Rome is it's worse. It's worse now than when the, these books have been written. So anyway, what is the answer of the Archbishop about the necessity of being Roman? He says, quote, We hold fast with all our heart and with all our soul to Catholic Rome, guardian of the Catholic faith, not guardian of the Council Vatican II, guardian of the Catholic faith and of the traditions necessary to preserve this faith. We hold fast to eternal Rome, mistress of wisdom and truth. We refuse, on the other hand, and have always refused to follow the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-protestant tendencies which were clearly evident in the Second Vatican Council and after the Council in all the reforms which issued from it. I repeat, we refuse and have always refused to follow the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies. It's very clear. This is the Rome that we follow. That's the eternal Rome, guardian of truth. A 
another quote from the same document about that question of Rome. That is why we hold fast to all that has been believed and practiced in the faith, morals, liturgy, teaching of the catechism, formation of the priest, and institution of the church by the church of all time. To all these things as codified in those books which saw they before the modernist influence of the council. This we shall do until such time that the true light of tradition dissipates the darkness obscuring the sky of eternal Rome. So we adhere to eternal Rome and we defend and love eternal Rome and by our battle, by our combat, that's the greatest service we can give her. By doing this, I continue the quote, with the grace of God and the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary and that of Saint Joseph and Saint Pius X, we are assured of remaining faithful to the Roman Catholic Church and to all the successors of Peter and of being the fidelis dispensadores, the faithful dispensators of the mysteries of our Lord. This is our love for Rome that we are willing to be vilified and to be called names because of our fidelity to the Rome of all time. The last quote about this first argument is taken from the, an interview of the Archbishop given to the magazine Le Figaro, French magazine, in August the 4, 1976. Quote, the adoption of the liberal thesis by a council could only have taken place in a pastoral council that was not infallible and cannot be explained except through a secret and meticulous preparation. You have all the details of these secrecy, uh, secret preparations in the book but from uh, Father Wilken, The Rain Flows into the Diver. I think we have a copy downstairs. That the historians will end up discovering to the great astonishment of the Catholics, of the Catholics who, who confuse the eternal Roman Catholic Church with human Rome, susceptible of being invaded by enemies covered in scarlet. So this is the confusion here between eternal Rome and the human Rome. A second argument. I'm tired to have to answer to all those arguments. I wish people would stop coming up with new ones all the time. At the end of today, I will have answered 15 of them in three sermons. The, so, the second argument that I heard oh, our situation is abnormal. It gives us a greater freedom and uh, maybe a greater comfort than if we would be uh, with an agreement with Rome where we would have to follow uh, basically the structure and so forth and so on. Well, I have nothing against such a greater freedom from error and a greater comfort that comes from the security security that we know that we are preaching the truth. When you come here, you know that we are preaching the truth. I receive phone calls from people going to indult masses about moral questions, and they tell me, Father, I go to the indult. I don't go to your chapel. I have a problem. I am phoning you 
because I know for sure that your answer will be the truth. I have got quite a few phone calls like that. So you come here because of that comfort, that security, that you are going to receive the truth, and that you are going to receive valid sacraments. Because your priest, the society priest, have been ordained by either the archbishop himself or by one of his four successor bishops. And you know that not only they will use the proper liturgical rite, but they will have the proper intention, which is as well a requirement for the validity. We never know what the intention of a modernist bishop may have when he ordains a priest, even in the traditional rite. And we don't know what kind of intention the bishop who consecrated that bishop had. But this will be the subject of another sermon. Be, be at peace. That will, that's a bit too long. But that's why you come. That's why you come to confession to us. Because you know that we have been validly ordained. So our situation is abnormal. We should go back into the mainstream. We should go back. Oh, with all the guarantees, of course like what they have given to Don Gerard. We saw that a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks ago. Oh, all the guarantees from the enemies of the church. The enemies of the church are going to give us guarantees. Well, what, here, that's one, uh, uh, I will tell you what kind of guarantee. It comes from an interview of the Archbishop to the French magazine of the District of France, the Society uh, magazine of the District of France, Fidelité, number 70, page 16. And it has to do from, by the way, this quote here I got in French. It comes from a document that was released on the Internet a few days ago and that contained the analysis of Bishop Galareta about uh, this question of agreement with Rome. Um, I've tried to find it in English. It is not available yet. But it's a 12-page document against an agreement from Bishop Galareta. So we have three bishops who have gone public against this. Anyways, so the question of the magazine, uh, question asked to Archbishop of Fèvre was about a document written by and published by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in 1989. And so in those days, the head of that congregation was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. So that... Cardinal Ratzinger has penned up an oath, an oath of fidelity that every new priest and every appointed bishop has to make before his ordination. And it's a very tricky document. I read it myself and it's very tricky because at the beginning it looks traditional. There is the profession of faith, the credo is the real credo of all times, no problem, and all the documents and so forth and so on. But, but, there are little uh, annotations, what we call the fine print, and that's always where the snack is, the fine print, that says that the oath is made to the magisterium of the conciliar church. And so here's what the Archbishop says about that. So he talks about the first part that has no problem, uh, the credo and all that is already, is already. No. But he said, the third 
annotation is very bad. Practically, it means that we are going to align oneself, is, if he pronounced the oath, he is going to align himself on what the bishops of the old world think today. In the introduction to the old text, it is indeed clearly indicated that this annotation had been added in reason of the spirit of the council. It refers itself to the council and to the so-called magisterium of today, which is the one of the conciliaris. As it is, that formula is dangerous and it shows very well the spirit of these people with whom it is impossible to come to an understanding. It is absolutely ridiculous and false to present this oath of fidelity as some people did as a kind of a new form of the former oath of anti-modernism. All the poison is in that third annotation which seems to have been put there expressively to oblige those who are rallied, reconciled to Rome, to oblige them to sign this profession of faith and this oath, and thereby to profess their full agreement with the bishop. By these new texts, we are submitting ourselves to the council and to all the conciliary bishops. This is their mind, this is their spirit, and we will not change that. So if we have an agreement, we will have the priests of the society, not only the new ones, we'll have to sign it. It has become uh, the law of the church in 1989 that we agree with the magisterium, the teaching of the modern church. So yes, our situation is abnormal because we refuse to sign these things. Another answer to that. This reformation, and that answer here is back to the declaration of 1974. This reformation born of liberalism and modernism is poisoned through and through. It derives from heresy and ends in heresy. Even if all its acts are not formally heretical, it is therefore impossible for any conscientious and faithful Catholic to espouse this reformation or to submit to it in any way whatsoever. It is impossible for a Catholic in conscience to submit to that church in any way whatsoever. The only attitude of faithfulness to the church and to Catholic doctrine in view of our salvation is a categorical refusal to accept this reformation. So yes, we are in an abnormal situation. Yes, we have that comfort of the knowledge that we are in security and that we are free from the errors of modern church, that we don't have to sign that new oath of fidelity to the council. Third argument. Faithful, the faithful and the members of the SSPX must be silent, and they must obey the hierarchy because they have the grace of state. 
Now there is an answer, a first answer to that. And that comes from common sense. If five popes who are endowed, and that's a dogma of the faith, with the charism of infallibility, if five popes have failed the Catholics, so much more uh, the superiors of any religious congregation, whatever holy it may be, they don't have that charism of infallibility, therefore they can also fail. It's just a question, this answer just comes from common sense. And as far as I know, there is nothing in the Catholic faith that says that we should stop using our common sense, that we, use, we should stop using our intelligence. If there is, you let me know. Answer to that from the same document of the Archbishop. Declaration 74. No authority, not even the highest in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or to diminish our Catholic faith so clearly expressed and professed by the Church's Magisterium for 19 centuries. That, another answer, the same document. That is why, without any spirit of rebellion, bitterness, or resentment, we pursue our work of forming priests with the timeless magisterium as our guide. We are persuaded that we can render no greater service to the Holy Catholic Church to the sovereign pontiff, and to posterity. So we just have to continue as we are, and one day they will come back to their senses, if only because they will see the ruins that have accumulated. They will understand one day that they are a dying breed, and we will be there solid as a rock to help them when this day comes. When they will show us that they really want to save the church. And they will show this to us when they will stop preaching error. When they will stop allowing new mass, the new mass to be said. That will be the sign. When they will scrap away the council and the new mass. Fourth argument. Oh, there was a very nice letter of the Pope on the priesthood. Very traditional letter of the Pope on the priesthood. And uh, June the 10th, uh, the Pope sent a message to the Eucharistic Congress of Ireland. I read it. So you cannot see that I... I'm not open to them. I read the document. Very nice. Very nice letter about the Holy Eucharist of so on. So th what does that mean? That means they have good writers that can write a nice letter that sounds Catholic. But my dear friends, they have done the same since the, ten of, uh, the time of Paul VI. Try to remember. They always came up about once a year with either a traditional document about the priesthood, about the necessity of confession. Uh, always came up. And then we thought, oh, they are changing. They are going back to tradition. It's the same old kind of... Um, of uh, trying to make us bait. It's a bait. We are like fishes that they try to hook on the bait. And so therefore, we will see those documents, they have absolutely no value 
in as long as they continue in their actions to promote error and the new mass. The new mass is an abomination. So they can write to me a new letter about the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist and the sacrifice of the Mass every day. They can send me a letter. In as long as they keep that bastard Mass, as Richard said, have called her, a bastard Mass, a Protestant Mass, the Mass of Luther, he called it. In as long as they keep this, then their words mean nothing. If I'm telling you that I love you, and every time I see you I slap you on the face, I don't know if you will believe me for long. Answer of the Archbishop, 1974. All these reforms indeed have contributed and are still contributing to the destruction of the church, to the ruin of the priesthood, to the abolition of the sacrifice of the mass and of the sacraments. Abolition because they become increasingly invalid. But I'll come back to that in another sermon. It contributes to the disappearance of religious life, to a naturalist and Teilhardian teaching in universities, seminaries, and catechistics, a teaching derived from liberalism and Protestantism, many times condemned by the solemn magisterium of the church. So they can write whatever they want. Their action speaks louder. Continue the same document. It is impossible to modify profoundly the Lex Orandi, the law of prayer, without modifying the Lex Credendi, the law of belief. The, to the Novus Ordo Mise, the new Mass, correspond a new catechism, a new priesthood, new seminaries, charismatic Pentecostal church, all things opposed to orthodoxy and the perennial teaching of the church. Give you a practical example taken from a sermon of Bishop this year, June 29, 2002, ten years ago in Econ. To give you a practical example about uh, the contradiction between the nice documents on the Eucharist and their action. And this is in reaction to an uh, official document of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith published in January 17, 2001 by, once again, His Eminence Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. In that document, the Congregation Doctrine of the Faith answered a question about the validity of the Mass celebrated in an oriental rite. And they called that uh, the anaphora of Adai et Mari, the part of the Mass where the consecration is supposed to take place. And they say, according to that part of that liturgy, is the Mass valid or not? Now the big distinction of this special oriental rite was that when the priest arrives at that place where he's supposed to do the consecration, there are no words. He says nothing. So it's like me, if I go on the altar there, and when I'm supposed to say, this is my blood, this is my blood, I say nothing. There's a big blank on the page, and I say nothing. So a child in catechism here could say, well, of course it's invalid. If you don't say the words of the consecration, how can the Mass be valid? Now here's what uh, Bishop Tissi has to say about the answer of that congregation. The answer is, the Mass is valid without the words of consecration. Bishop Tissier speaks, You have all read this. We have explained it. 
It is a recent declaration by Cardinal Ratzinger and the International Theological Commission. The Mass is valid even without the words of consecration. Oh, they love tradition. Oh, they love the traditional Mass. They will give us all the guarantees. We will be safe. And yet they say, oh, it's okay if uh, there's no word of consecration, it's still valid. So, Bishop this year continues, what good is a priest? In effect, the laity could celebrate the Mass. The priest serves for hardly anything since he does not even have to pronounce the words of Christ so that the Mass is valid. It's, it's incredible, my dear faithful. So this, uh, this is a very practical answer to the, those nice documents on the priesthood. Oh, he wrote so nice a letter. Sure. I can do the same too. The last and final argument. If we sign with Rome, if we sign an agreement with Rome, they will repair an injustice made against us. They will give us back our title of Catholics. First of all, let us remember that this injustice and this withholding of our title of Catholics has not come from the Catholic Church, my dear brethren. It has come from the modernist conciliar church. The Catholic Church, my dear brethren, all the saints, all the angels, our Lord Himself, the Most Holy Trinity, they call us Catholics. They are happy with what we do. So we don't need to go and run and kiss and hug and smile to get a title of Catholic from those people who are not anymore Catholics. Archbishop Lefebvre, from his book, The Spiritual Journey, so is a quote I had two weeks ago, but it's still very relevant uh, to answer this objection, oh, that we will be given the title of Catholic. He talks about the new church. This apostasy makes its members, the members of the conciliar church, adulterers, schismatics, opposed to all tradition, separated from the past of the church, and thus separated from the church of today in the measure that this church of today remains faithful to the church of our Lord. So it is them who have forfeited that title of Catholics the day they have turned their back on the church, on the traditional church, the church of the past, which is the church of today, because people of today, like us, continue to uphold the deposit of the faith. And they are not. And therefore, they have no lesson to give us, and we have no titles to receive from them. So therefore, my dear, but you see by all those specious arguments, false arguments, that we are in trouble. And that's because we thought that we had finally come to a clear understanding between the two churches and apparently as time passed, we forgot about the difference. We looked at the externals and we thought, oh, a Pope dressed in white who says, in the name of the Father, Son, 
uh, in Latin, so therefore they are back to tradition. They write nice letters, oh, they are back to tradition. They are not. They are still the enemies of the precious blood of Christ. They are the enemies of the salvation of souls, save for which God himself has shed his blood. So we should have them, not the persons, but the errors, in abomination and horror. And we should pray for the destruction of that conciliar church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Ghost, Amen.